Hello everyone to the 67th community demo, formal community demo. Uh, before starting with today's demo, I would like to uh, thank everyone for submitting their uh, call for papers, CFPs in for the OS Camp conference that we're going to have in November. So thank you everyone. And uh, if you haven't checked, we have a tweet on Azure, so you can go on the Foreman uh, uh, Twitter and you can check the tweet. Uh, Today we have a lot of uh, things in our agenda, a lot of topics in our agenda. Uh, so let's go by, through them one by one. So first we have Azure provisioning support by Aditi. Then we would uh, look at updates on Catillo host registration by Jonathan. Uh, after that we'll see content view module streaming filters and uh, Pulp3 smart proxy syncing by Partha. We will then look at Pulp3 Docker CV publishing by Ian. Uh, followed by Docker pull with uh, Pulp3 by John and file upload with Pulp3 by Samir. So uh, let's start with the demo without wasting much of time. Uh, uh, so I would like to start with Aditi uh, by Azure. She, she will talk about Azure provisioning uh, support. So over to you, Aditi. Thank you, Rahul. Let me share my screen. Uh, hope that is visible. Yes, that is. Thank you. So this demo actually uh, focuses on the uh, compute resource, uh, uh, Azure resource manager being a compute resource. So earlier we had Azure as a provider, but uh, since that has been deprecated long way back, uh, which was the Azure version one. So now we are bringing in the uh, Azure Resource Manager, which is the version 2 API. So uh, actually the modifications here with respect to code uh, include that the POG uh, library has been removed altogether as a dependency from uh, Foreman Azure RM. So now what we have done is we have uh, entirely uh, used the Ruby SDK for Azure RM. And uh, that's how this uh, plugin has been newly developed or uh, refactored. So let me walk you through uh, this, uh, this plugin. So on your compute resource page, you can create a compute resource from Azure RM provider. So if you go and select, you, if you uh, enable this plugin, uh, similar to any other plugin, you can get this provider. And these would be the fields. Uh, so any Azure, any, uh, client that we have is if they are using Azure subscription, if they are currently entitled to one, they can get the, they uh, definitely uh, have these credentials with them and they can actually connect through Foreman. So I already have one of the compute resources from Azure RM provider created. And it is of type Azure resource manager, as you can see. So, and I have an image. Now this is entirely image-based provisioning. So I've also created one image, which is the CentOS image here. And uh, this is its UUID. Uh, just for instance, uh, uh, how we have in AWS, uh, we have the AMI ID of an image. So similarly here, we have something called marketplace URN. So this identifies the image that we would like to use. So uh, without wasting any more time, I will, Quickly jump to the demo so that you can get a glance. So this is our hosts page where um, I'll be selecting the Azure resource provider, uh, Azure resource manager as uh, the deploying provider. As you can see, this is already created here. And uh, I'll, I, I go and select the operating system and images. And here I'm using finish template right now. Uh, support for user data is also there. So um, under this virtual machines tab, actually, uh, these are uh, some of the fields, uh, let's say, uh, for instance, Azure reg uh, VM size or uh, resource groups. So they are loaded based on the uh, uh, on the region that you select. So let's say if you have selected uh, uh, East US, so you will get a specific set of uh, VM sizes. And 
it, it uh, this uh, the vm sizes are predefined as per their as per uh, microsoft azure's um, uh, azure's standards so those sizes we can select with respect to the uh, azure regions that we are pre uh, that we prefer so here uh, username and password is an additional um, enhancement in this uh, in this provider we usually do not have separate username passwords or ssh key or an option to give password and ssh key uh, either or uh, or uh, authentication mechanism but here you can also set password or ssh key whichever option you would like to uh, get. and uh, in the end we actually go to the interfaces so here you can uh, since the domain uh, whichever you have and these subnets which i have selected so these come from azure itself so yeah, I, these are the fields that you need to give it, supply to it, and yes, it starts provisioning. So here, um, as you can see, right now it's in pending installation state, but uh, uh, I mean, as of now, uh, uh, it once if you develop this, since I was, uh, while developing, I was using, I was, I set up my development environment inside uh, uh, the Azure cloud itself so that the phone home or the SSH steps are executed and the and based on the public IP the communication uh, be it the be, uh, I mean the communication both ways as possible so that uh, it would then show the build status installed so this is uh, the uh, this would be the host uh, the uh, details view for your host under Azure and it gets the public IP from Azure's uh, submit itself. And these are some of the details based on the subscription. So what your subscription and your uh, uh, resource groups and uh, machine name you provide, uh, the location that you select and the size that you would want of your VM, that is all uh, displayed here in the VM details page. So from my side, I had this much. Any questions would be welcome to. So yeah, that's all from my side. Thank you. That was really informative. Uh, and thanks for sharing uh, the Azure integration, the latest Azure integration uh, with the community today. Uh, next up, we have updates on Catilla host registration by uh, Jonathan. So over to you, Jonathan. Thank you, Rahul. And hello, everyone. So if you were in the community demo maybe uh, two or three sessions ago, I presented on some of the changes that we made in Catello 3.12 in terms of content host registration. And uh, since then, we've gotten some feedback, both from the Foreman community and from Red Hat customers using Foreman as part of Red Hat Satellite. And um, we're making some changes um, as a result of that feedback and um, those changes that we made in Catello 312. But just a quick recap of um, what we did in 312. When registering a content host, the DMI UUID reported by subscription manager needed to be unique across all of the content hosts in the, in, in the infrastructure. Second, and um, perhaps the most um, <clears throat> confusing or unfortunate aspect is that um, we also made, hosts, made it so that hosts um, cannot assume or take over the profile of other hosts um, unless their host name and DMI UUID matches. This was... Um, actually a behavior that a lot of folks were relying on when rebuilding a host, um, registering, seeing that existing host there, matching it by the host name and taking over its registration. We were blocking that because of this restriction around the DMI UUID. <clears throat> so the feedback we got was um, around those two changes, both of which manifest as this error um, to the client when registering. So you may have seen this when registering, or maybe you saw it on the community forum, um, people looking for guidance on what this means, how to work around it, and that kind of thing. So as part of 3.14 in Catello, we're making some changes to 
alleviate the um, pain that is being uh, encountered with these changes that we made in 3.12. And basically, we are adding two new settings in Catello. Um, the first one is called Host Profile Assume, and the second is called Host Duplicate DMI UUIDs. The first one basically um, allows you to continue to assume um, the profile of new hosts, even if the DMI UUID of the host does not match the existing profile, even when they match by host name. Um, this is very much like the original behavior that we had before 3.12. And in fact, we're defaulting this um, to true. So no one will even have to go and make a change to um, get this behavior. Of course, the DMI UUID does still have to be unique across all of the infrastructure, but it can be different than the host, which is already registered with that host name. The second one is host du duplicate DMI UUIDs. And um, while we would really encourage you to have unique DMI UUIDs across your infrastructure, in some situations that isn't really feasible. If the UUID is being reported from the hardware, um, we've actually gotten reports that many VMs can share this UUID as a result of um, a particular value in the hardware. And that can be overridden in numerous ways, but we've kind of um, have given users a really easy way with this setting to work around that um, temporarily while they figure out the other um, um, kind of the root cause of that. That's all I had for the slides. Let me give a quick demo of uh, what I'm talking about here. Right. So let's, let me show you my um, my UI and the kind of system setup I've got going on. I have two clients here, Catello Client A and Catello Client B. And if I look at the fact values for these hosts, there's Client A and Client B. They have two um, different DMI UUIDs. Catello Client A and Catello Client B. I've overridden these um, so they're uh, human legible rather than being a randomly generated value like this. And over here in the settings tab, this is under content. You can see the new settings, which I had just gone over. So um, host profile assume defaults to true, going back more or less to the pre 3.12 behavior. So let me show you uh, kind of what that looks like when we do a new host registration. I'm on my Catello client B and uh, I printed out its DMI UUID here, which matched what we just saw in the UI. Now I'm going to override this value, um, maybe B-1. So it's going to have a new DMI UUID. And uh, in Catello 3.12, if I were to register this machine again, it would fail because of this mismatch of the DMI UUIDs. But because of this new setting in place and the default value being true, um, the registration is going to succeed. Again, going back to that pre-312 behavior. But if you really do want to keep this enforcement strict, you can obviously override it to no. Um, maybe at some point in the future, this will become the, the default behavior, having it set to no. But um, I think we need some larger uh, discussions around that. So um, if I refresh here, I should see my new uh, DMI UUID. And there it is, dash B dash one. Um, so the second setting in the UI is the duplicate DMI UUIDs. And like I said, this is around um, kind of an unavoidable situation where you have multiple content hosts reporting that same DMI UUID. How do you get them all registered and receiving content? Well, um, as a kind of a stopgap solution, you can take the value here and um, give it the value of that DMI UUID that's having is being reported by multiple hosts. So for the sake of experiment here, I'm going to do Catello client A and um, save this value. And I'm going to go back to my Catello client B um, and I'm going to override its DMI UUID to match Catello client A. Clear this and um, show you that I've overridden this value. And I'm going to re-register the system. I'm going to Manager clean and subscription manager register. 
And if I had not provided this value in the setting, this registration would fail. However, it is going to succeed. But um, what it does is kind of unique. And I'll show you what that is. Um, now that it has successfully registered, if I go back to my host's uh, facts value list and I refresh for Catello client B, um, here we see that it has a UUID value, which we did not give it. Um, when a UUID is specified in this setting, subsequent registrations will get a randomly generated value that the registration succeeds and the host can continue to receive critical updates and things like that. Um, again, this is kind of a stopgap solution. We would really encourage folks to figure out in their infrastructure why their hosts are reporting the same value. But um, this is there as kind of a workaround um, in those times when we really need to push content out. And uh, I think those things are really gonna help um, some of the feedback we've received since 3.12. And um, looking forward to getting that out in 3.14. And I think we're also gonna backport into 3.13.1. And that's all that I had, thank you so much. Thanks, Jonathan. This was uh, really very helpful. Uh, I think uh, a lot of the folks are gonna find this uh, very helpful and uh, hope you get good feedbacks. Uh, so next up, we have uh, Partha, who will, who will actually speak about two topics that he has. One about content view model stream uh, filters and Pulp 3 smart proxy syncing. So over to you, Partha. Thank you, Rahul. Uh, let me share my screen. Mm -hmm. There you go. Are you able to see my screen? Think so. Okay. So uh, I have two topics to discuss today. Uh, one is about content view module filtering, and the other topic is about Pulp three smart proxy syncing. So I'm I'm going to start with the Pulp three smart proxy syncing part first. So the way so with with Pulp three. <clears throat> Uh, we, we recently added support for smart proxies to, that so that it could mirror Pulp3 content like Pulp3 file, file content, etc. And so part of that, uh, part of the, the, way, the way the smart proxy is written, it will it'll look at the features that belong to the smart proxy. If it's a Pulp, if it says if it says Pulp3, then we know that it supports Pulp3 content types, and we use that as an indicator that when we are mirroring over, when the, when the master mirrors its content over to the to the smart proxy, it, it, it'll it'll see it'll see if it's a Pulp3 content type and mirror mirror it accordingly. <clears throat> to set up a Pulp3 proxy, smart proxy, you will have to follow the instructions on the Pulp3 integration page that we have. It's on the it's on so and yeah it's a little bit of a detour because we are still we're, we still haven't merged this the forklift PRN which, which is close to getting but you we, we can use this to set up our Pulp three proxies and once our proxies are set up uh, okay. It'll, so if it, so the and if you had a ref, if you refresh the features, you should be able to get Pulp three here after you set up the proxy. Now, one thing I would like to show uh, so let me hit the edit on this. So what I've made here is I said sync everything that's in the dev environment over to the smart proxy and. Yeah. Then go I go to my content views. I have I have a dev environment basically a library and a dev environment, two different environment lifecycle environments. So so I've I have synced version one to the dev environment already. Let's let's see what was in version one. 
version one had this file small repository. So let me just go to the smart proxy terminal and just show how it looks. Uh, there you go. So let's see. Yeah, if I did the file, so this lists the files I have, and I you will see file small here, the last one. So it's, this is a pre, this is the previous sync. So when I previously synced, I I it, when I previously promoted the report, promoted the content view to the dev environment. This the the file small repo got synced on my smart proxy. And go back here. Let let me do that again for version two now because version two is only in library. It's not in it's not in dev environment yet. And just to be clear, let's see what's in version two. Version two has two repo repos. It has a file small repo and a file two repo. So let me promote this guy over to the dev environment again. They have promoted it. Let's see whether it did the trick. So we can rerun. This is on my smart proxy again. So I can say, find me all the repositories. Okay, which one was it? Yeah, so yeah, you should, I should be able to see, find me all the remotes. Let me do that one. That'll tell us clearer. So here it is. There's file two okay, URL. Uh, so Paul 3 has like, uh, I uh, might be spoken about in previous demos, but Paul 3 has what, what are called, uh, have, has repositories, remotes that point to those repositories, publications and distributions. So like four entity types that, four, four different factors that we need to consider when we are syncing. And so that's why that one, this is, this is the repositories. Uh, and the remote points to remote will tell us where is remote will tell us to the feed it's pointing to. So it's it is going to be syncing from here. So in the in our case, it's going to be syncing from here. Then when we run a sync operation on this repo, it'll be pulling content from here. And so it's trying to say. Very similar to what we have for pulp two. It's the same concept, but pulp three, we just need, we just have to put it in a different entity. And, uh, all right. So let, let's see, if, let's see if a distribution got created. Distribution is the way we pull content. So, so here, yeah, there, there's a distribution called file two. So this is kind of like the base URL we can use to pull content. So let me see if I can, let me see if I can open this in a new tab. So went there. So one of the changes is, uh, yeah. So there you go, okay. There's something, some mistake I have here, okay. Uh, I'll try here. Maybe maybe it's not. It doesn't like the HTTPS. Uh, is by the curl URL I had, and the one dot ISO. I think. Uh, oh, ISOs. There you go. So. <laughs> As says, you can see it's pulling content from this ISOs directory from my proxy itself, not from my main server. So the, uh, that basically concludes my section on uh, proxy syncing. Uh, feel free to ask me questions, IRC or email or anything. Uh, let me go to content view module stream filters now. 
it's a kind of a different topic, but deals with content use. So <laughs> I have, let me show you my products list here again. I have a product with two file repos and one yum repo. You see this yum repo has like seven errata, 14 module streams, 22 packages. And so let me create a content. So let me create a content view with with that. Okay. Let me add this yum repo that I have here. So let, let me just publish the basic version first without anything. So there you go. The basic version has 22 packages, six errata, and 14 module streams. Let's see what some of those module streams are and what some of the packages look like. There you go. So I have so the typical zoo repo that we use for everything or for demoing everything. So for all our demos, so it has. So we, I want to see which one of this is a modular RPM, like which one of these belong to a module. I can search by saying modular equals true. Shows me, okay, so there are a bunch of them that are, that belong to modules. I'm guessing this is below, this, below, this package, Walrus belongs to the Walrus module that I've created in my zoo repo. So, I'm going to add a filter now that says include walrus only. Okay, so it's saying just copy the contents, the packages that belong to walrus, the module walrus. So I do that by selecting a module stream type or I'm specifying it as an include filter. So here again, it shows me all the modules, list of modules that I can choose to add. So I want to, I want to only include this guy, Walrus 71. If I did a list here, I should see him there. Now, if I publish this guy, I would expect to see whatever belongs to the Walrus module. Give it some time. There you go. So let's see. Oh yeah. So what happened here was if you checked what are the modular RPMs that got copied, should be oh equals to sorry. And that's what I needed. Sorry. What are the modular RPMs that got copied? That's only 0.7. But our existing package filters, the filters here, like if you, so the you saw that in in my published version, there were nine packages listed here, out of which out of which one was a modular package. So the, the way the modules and filters works is it it only affects the module streams. It doesn't try to mess with non-modular packages. So all the non-modular packages or packages that did belong, didn't belong to a module got copied over. Uh, so to control these, you will have to use a package filter separately to control the non-modular packages. Uh, meanwhile, one of the other changes in our filters is that is now we can we can actually choose okay for a second 
now we can use we can actually say I want this modular errata copied over so include errata so if I had an errata with modules in it it is only going to include uh, so I can be I can be really specific on I can I can be really specific on what modules get copied over. So I create a typical errata filter, but here you see that a couple of these pterodactyl and the duck kangaroo erratum, these all have modules in them. This doesn't the one pack I know because I, I, the repo has it that way in such a manner. So anyway, the pterodactyl erratum. So if I if I say include only this guy only the modules belonging to the pterodactyl random and the packages belonging to that module will get copied over so if i did publish again it doesn't so this is only it does it should not affect the non modular pms but there you go so here it is has the pterodactyl rpm though we said copy only one errata over so it only copied the packages that belong to that errata so if i did uh, no, modular is true this is this is the modular one and it, in fact, we also have, yeah, you can see that it's, this has modules in it, this errata has modules in it. Uh, yeah, so this works very similar to any other filter we have, like basically it's just a new addition to filter on module streams. Uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I wanted to show, uh, demo for this. Thank you. Thanks, Bata. Uh, this was very helpful, and uh, uh, I hope people benefit out of this. It was uh, really nice. Uh, so, moving on, next up, uh, we have Pulp3 Docker uh, CV uh, publishing by Ian. So, over to you, Ian. Okay, thanks, Rahul. Um, all right, let's get started here. So, I have Quick update here um, on the Pulp3 Docker support in Catello. Um, so what I'm showing, going to be showing here is content view publishing um, with Pulp3 and Docker content. Um, so on my Foreman screen here, we can see that I've published a content view. I've got a version one here, and we've got some content. We've got 13 manifests and eight manifest lists. And then this says 16 tags. That's a bug. It's duplicated right now. Um, but I will show where that information is actually coming from. Um, now, to actually get the content view publishing to work, we had to rework the tag model, um, where before um, each tag had just one repository. Now each tag can have many repositories. Um, so let's see where this content actually is in Pulp3. So just to show, I'll show the first uh, version of the repository. There's no content in here. And then when the content was actually added, now we can see the content we have here. So Docker blob, it says count 31. Docker manifest, it says 21. Now that's a grouping of the manifests and the manifest lists. So that adds up here. 13 and 8. Um, and then Docker tags, we have 8. It should be showing 8 here, um, but you can see that it's it's double. So um, that adds up at least with the bug. Um, and so besides that, um, filter support isn't working quite yet, um, but that is on the way. It should be working quite soon. Um, and yeah, honestly, that's that's it for this. Um, and I'll be up next time soon with another update uh, once the filters are done.
for Pulp 3. So yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ian. That was great. And uh, hope to see you with uh, the filter update uh, soon. Uh, next up, we have file upload with Pulp 3 by Samir. Okay. Uh, so today I'm going to demo file upload with Pulp 3. So right now to demo this, I have a repository with zero file content. And I have a hammer box here. Let me just yeah. So I'll try to upload the uh, content from Hammer into this repository. So this should really go through. Ignore this error loading module that's because I don't have a module in this setup. So as you can see, it says successfully uploaded. And if I go back to the UI, if I let loads, I can show you what going on in Pulp. So this is the repository in Pulp 3. So right now we are at version 2 because we uploaded a file. So initially it gets created as version 1. And every time you upload content, the version increases. So we can see that we have one file added to the repository. Can you see this now? And you can also see this on the UI and also similar to what you could do earlier, you can upload directories. I have a directory here, uh, example uploads. So I will I'll try to upload this directory onto the same repository. And it should go over all the files in the directory and upload them one at a time. This directory, I think, has three files. So. So this has successfully uploaded all the files. Refresh this page and come back to this later. Uh, now if you look at the repository, it has gone to version 5 because we uploaded three files from the directory. So it actually increases the version for every file that is uploaded. Now if we go here and check, it now has four. And you should see the same on the UI once it's loaded. Yeah. Yeah. So you see these three files, and this is the first one that we upload. And similarly, you can do uploads from the UI. So the flow is pretty much the same as Pulp 2. Is talking to Pulp 3 behind the scene. It should behave just the same. If it doesn't, you should probably raise a bug. If you see now, we have five files, and one of them is the file that we uploaded from the UI. That should be it from. Uh, great. Uh, thanks a lot, Sami, uh, for this information. Uh, next, we have a uh, Docker pull with Pulp 3 by John Mitch. So over to you, John. 
Thanks, Raul. Let me share my screen. Um, so I, uh, I'm going to present another aspect of the Pulp 3 changes. Um, we, in Pulp 2, we had the ability to, you could use Hello as a sort of a registry, a poll only registry um, for container images. And you could pull them and it would get them from, or it would use a service called Crane to uh, serve those images. And of course, in Pulp 3, we want to add the same functionality, to make it a seamless transition. Um, and Pulp 3 supports posting images or acting as a container registry natively. Uh, so this is just me adding support for that. Um, there's really not a ton of new functionality, but I will give a, a quick demo. Um, so I have a very basic uh, image here on Docker Hub, and I've synced that to Catello. Um, and then you can see there's this published at URL. Uh, and this actually is still the crane URL. We do have to update this. Um, and it's the crane URL because uh, it has this 5,000 in it. So if I actually take out that 5,000 um, and just pull directly from Catello, so I'm using Podman here, Podman pull um, my host name and then this name that is created by Catello, uh, that will pull that image down. And we can see it in Podman images. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the, the functionality there. Same functionality, but just under the hood, it's now using Pulp 3. Um, one piece that did change is when you have a image that does not exist, it actually gives you an error message. Um, for some reason on Podman, it spits out a lot, uh, but it does give you this error message, doesn't exist, it's not found. And Docker is a little more concise here. Doesn't exist, was not found. Uh, previously, it used to just like error out and you get some trace back. Um, so yeah, that's it. Just uh, more Pulp 3 support. Thanks. Thanks, John, uh, for enlightening us with uh, the Podman and the containers and the images. So uh, that would end our uh, four-minute community demo number 67. Uh, see you guys in the next community demo. Bye-bye.